1955's Godzilla Raids Again, directed by Motoyoshi Oda. After the success of Gojira, a welcome home party was thrown for executive producer Awayo Mori, who was away while Godzilla stomped on Tokyo and opening day box office records. Mori wasted no time, and while partying, he told producer Tomoyuki Tanaka to begin making a sequel. This movie often gets described as rushed, because, well, it was. 1954 and 55 would end up being crowded years for monster movies. In the U.S., you had giant ants attacking Los Angeles in Them. A giant tarantula scaring the shit out of people in Arizona, and I'm not gonna show it because I hate spiders. Only Kumanga is allowed here. There was also a giant octopus destroying San Francisco in 1955's It Came From Beneath the Sea. This film would actually get a nice little cameo in the 1998 TriStar Godzilla. Despite giving Godzilla the sensitive touch needed to help it become more than just a monster movie, Mori thought that the film's director, Ishiro Honda, would be better suited for movies that revolved around women due to his thoughtful nature. Honda was a loyal company man and he would not resist what some might view as a slight. Not only that, but when Godzilla King of the Monsters was reverse imported back to Japan, the advertisers would market it as 100 times more interesting than the original. But Honda would take that in stride as well. He understood the business. While the production of the new Godzilla movie began, he would go off to do as the company requested and direct the movie Love Tide, or Love Makeup, depending on the translation. Toho would promote it as a gorgeous love melodrama with Toho's best cast, meant for all the women fans. Motoyoshi Odo would be tapped to direct this Godzilla sequel. Though Odo wasn't a part of The Three Crows, which was made up of Akira Kurosawa, Honda, and Senkichi Taniguchi, like them he also studied under director Kajiro Yamamoto. Toho had Oda making numerous movies every year. He was basically a movie-making machine for them, and he would always produce on time. This would end up being the only giant monster movie Oda would direct. Akira Ifakube would not be back to do the score for this sequel. It wasn't yet realized how important Ifakube's themes would be when conceptualizing Godzilla movies. And Ifakube himself was very busy at the time, creating scores for many movies throughout the year. So no Honda and no Ifakube, two of the main four would be absent for this project. Tanaka would tap Masaru Sato to create the music instead. Sato made a career out of making the score for movies and would end up becoming the second most prolific musician for Godzilla films, with his style being described by Godzilla historian Steve Reifel as a combination of jazz and contemporary music. It's Godzilla with a beat. Sato's score for the most part is much lighter than Ifakube's, and Sato's Godzilla themes over the years would usually be tied to John Fukuda's Godzilla movies and Ifakube with Honda's. I knew I could not do the same thing that Mr. Ifakube did. I had to do something unique. The script would be written by Takao Murata, co-written by Shigeki Hidaka. The script would be based on a Shigeru Kayama story, just like the original movie. Well, this will be the first time I'm watching the Japanese version of this film. And I have to admit, the Criterion Collection's pretty awesome. This story takes a different tack than the first, focusing much of its time on more everyday characters, unlike the prominent figures of authority like scientists and military officials. Our two main characters are Shioichi Skioka, played by Hiroshi Koizumi, and Koji Kobayashi, played by Minoru Chiaki. For Koizumi, this would be his first Godzilla film, but as we'd see, definitely not his last. Chiaki was in numerous Kurosawa films and most notably played Heiachi Hayashida, one of the Seven Samurai. Both actors do a fine job playing their characters, though perhaps their best parts are at the start of the film when both marine scouter pilots end up on the remote Uwato Island. It's there that both men encountered the two monster stars of the film. They recognize Godzilla, but they don't quite know what the other monster he's battling is. The first movie had a lot of on-location shots. This rush production is mostly shot in a studio, and that becomes obvious from the small island set they film this part on. In this film, Godzilla is the second generation Godzilla, as the first died in the original movie. This Godzilla has all the same abilities as the first one, though its dorsal fins do not light up when firing the incandescent light. The suit that was created was made much lighter and slimmer, so the suit actor can move around more during its fight with the other monster. From the side, the costume looks great, but unfortunately it looks kind of goofy when seen from straight away. The head would be made smaller as well and was equipped with movable eyes. A puppet would be made for some close-up scenes, and once again it looks noticeably different from the costume's head. The suit is referred to as Gyakushu Goji, a reference to the Japanese title of the film, Gojira no Gyakushu the word gyakushu meaning counterattack. 
Haro Nakajima returns to play Godzilla, solidifying himself as THE Godzilla and not taking turns with anyone this time around. Unlike last time, Godzilla would have another monster to contend with. Outside of King Kong's battle with the Tyrannosaurus Rex and the dinosaur battles in Lost World before that, this is one of the first giant monster battles in film history. While on this topic of earlier giant creature flicks, a movie I completely missed in my 1954 Godzilla video was The Great Buddha Arrival from 1934. In the movie, a giant Buddha statue comes to life and walks around Japan doing various things. This film was lost likely due to World War II, but it is considered the oldest known Japanese movie with an original kaiju-sized character in it. This is sort of a missing link between the early Japanese-made parody King Kong movie and Godzilla. The film would be remade in 2018. Toho employees would propose different names for this new creature during production, with one actor proposing the name Gyotos. The rejected names would be utilized in a child-friendly 1955 manga named Rampage Godzilla, where Godzilla sets out to become a professional wrestler. The monster's first battle ends with them falling into the ocean. Nakajima and Tezuka had to be in the suits for this part to make sure they didn't float on impact. Multiple crewmen would be on standby to make sure they both didn't drown. When the two pilots returned to Osaka, they let the authorities know what they saw. It's at this meeting where they determine the other monster is a giant Ankylosaurus from the Cretaceous period, awakened by nuclear testing, called Anguirus. The original English name given by Toho would be Angelus. Just a heads up, in most of my videos I go back and forth between calling him Angerus, Angerus, Angelus, um, so please save your comments, I don't care if I'm saying it wrong. In fact, I'll call him something completely different in this video just for fun. According to the movie, Ankyla Dukadillo is known to be extremely aggressive and violent. The monster is played by Katsumi Tezuka. Tezuka was the man who shared Godzilla responsibilities in the first film with Nakajima, but eventually lost out to his contemporary. Tezuka has a perfect opportunity for revenge. I'm sure it'll turn out great. The suit's head would be modeled by Tezu Toshimitsu and the body would be constructed by the Yagi brothers. According to Masao Yagi, Angerus' color was light emerald green, which obviously we wouldn't know from the black and white film, but you can see it in the promotional posters. Notably, this would be the last black and white Godzilla film. Toshimitsu also made clay models that envisioned Mr. Spiky over here as having its carapace or shell partially detached from its back. This can be seen when the two monsters fight at Osaka port, but it kept falling off, so after this part they just glued it to the base. The shell itself was very heavy, and Tezuka would have a rough go with it. The spikes on its back were simply made from paper and rubber paint, so they were actually quite safe, though easily damaged. A hand puppet would be created for this monster as well, and just like Godzilla, it's pretty obvious when they're on screen. As far as abilities go, Enka Ruka Dakadillo. Alright, I'll stop doing that now. As far as abilities go, Angerus was originally able to fire atomic breath from his mouth, just like Godzilla. It's also stated that Angerus' roar creates an ultrasonic wave, and that's the reason we see the castle start to crumble with that stop-motion animation before the monsters ram into it. Angerus is identified with the help of the Dinosaur Book, The Ruling Reptiles and Their Relatives, by Edwin Colbert. The book was published in 1945 and republished in 1951, but in this film it's what the authorities go to to figure out what Angerus is. This scene also features the returning Dr. Yamane, played by the legendary Takashi Shimura. Unfortunately, Shimura isn't given much to do here, and he seems rather uninterested at the prospect of another Godzilla, rather than terrified. Though, maybe it is in character for him to be despondent about the whole thing, as he did predict in the original film more Godzillas would appear if atomic weapon testing didn't stop. But in general, this scene drags on far too long, and even features a reshowing of the 1954 attack with no sound to accompany it. Yamane's prognosis is a dire one. Now that Serizawa and his oxygen destroyer are gone, there is no way to stop Godzilla, let alone another monster. An interesting trait is added to Godzilla in this part, however. Yamane mentions that he believes the monster is drawn to light, possibly reminding the creature of the H-bomb that awakened and irradiated him. Taking this information, the Japanese self-defense forces devise a plan. When Godzilla pops up in Osaka Bay, the city immediately issues a blackout. Chillingly, this is the same tactic used by the Japanese during World War II to protect their cities from Allied bombers. In the movie, fighter planes use flares to lure Godzilla out to sea. I can't put my finger on it, but I really like this shot. It looks kind of... off. And the music matches the disturbing mood. <laughs> the 
This flare idea seemingly works, with Godzilla changing trajectory and knocking down a lighthouse with a flick of its tail perhaps a reference to the infamous Rhydosaurus scene. Then the movie provides us with a prison break scene of sorts. Our main protagonist just happens to be in the area where this is taking place, one of many coincidences in this film. The chase scene leads to an explosion and a large fire. This of course couldn't have happened at a worse time as Godzilla takes notice. Something about that part always freaked me out. It's even creepier in the English version because they show a shot of the puppet and they use stock music instead. Later, I'll talk about why Godzilla has Anguirus's roar in that version. The roar stays the same for Godzilla in this movie, the Japanese one anyway, with Anguirus's roar created using a saxophone. Soon after Godzilla makes landfall in Osaka, Anguirus shows up as well, and this is where the special effects master Eiji Tsuburaya takes over. The monsters battle each other with the military firing everything they have at both of them. It makes for some pretty badass scenery. Screenwriter Murata originally wanted to show a lot more chaos and looting while the monsters fought, but the budget limits caused this idea to be tossed. Sato's choice for music during the battle was interesting. I didn't think the music should suggest they were trying to kill each other. I felt that the atmosphere of a game or competition was needed. Disturbing is a word I've already used, but it's really the only word I have for the shots where the two monsters seem to be fighting at ridiculously high speeds. And it's weird because this is supposed to be the lighter film of the first two, but whether intentional or not, I get more unsettled watching this movie than the original. There are the usual low-angled, slow, heavy shots filmed around 72 frames per second to give off the illusion of great size, but these high-speed shots were essentially an accident. The crew would use multiple cameras for their shoot, but one of them was not set to 72 frames per second. Subaraya wasn't pleased, but after seeing the fight footage at this speed, he said, The movement's not bad. Maybe we can use it. As for whose fault it was, well, there are mixed stories about that. Either way, this would lead to Superaya having one camera always set to that speed when filming future movies. Though I'm not sure if he ever used footage like this again. They tried not to show too many shots of Anguirus's hind legs, as Tezuka was sometimes moving around on his knees, and apparently the bottom of his feet were exposed. So a lot of the shots where you can see them are blocked by buildings and rubble. The monsters rumble their way towards Osaka Castle with a well-executed match shot from Tsuburaya. For this film, Toho was able to use the newly constructed soundstage, and though there aren't nearly as many miniatures as the original, the miniature Osaka is still impressive, the castle being the most intricate. This miniature was a heavy piece, so it had wires installed inside of it that could be pulled by the crew off camera to cause it to collapse. During the initial shoot, the monsters slammed into the castle and the crew pulled the wires, but it wouldn't come down. Subarai yelled cut and the cameras stopped rolling, but the crew with the wires didn't hear him and of course, with the cameras off, they succeeded in pulling the castle down. So they had to partially rebuild it and reshoot the scene. After throwing Anguirus through the massive castle, Godzilla bites down on his foe, drawing blood. I think. It's hard to see with the black and white, but I'm pretty sure that's blood. Godzilla then cooks up an Anguirus barbecue, completely torching his sparring buddy. Osaka is dealt the same fate before Godzilla heads back to the sea. Watching the entire scene from afar is Hidemi Yamaji, played by Setsuko Wakayama. Yamaji is Tsukiyoka's girlfriend and the daughter of Tsukiyoka's boss. She also works for her dad as the radio operator Tsukiyoka and Kobayashi communicate with while in the air. I know I talked earlier about possible unintentional disturbing parts, but the scene where Yamaji stares out her window as the city is going up in smoke is one of the few purposely grim shots, along with the camera pan of the morning after, both reminiscent of the darker tone of the original film. But this doesn't last too long. Instead of focusing on the human devastation, this movie just quickly moves locale in sort of a happy-go-lucky way. As David Callop points out in his book, A Critical History and Filmography of Toho's Godzilla series, there is a change in allegory in this movie. Whereas Godzilla in 1954 symbolized a travesty of war and atomic devastation, this movie denotes the process of post-war rebuilding. 
The main cast eventually all moved to Hokkaido, along with Mr. Tajima's business, which was destroyed in Osaka. While out drinking, they run into Tsukioka's old college friend, Tajima, played by Yoshio Tsuchiya. Tsuchiya actually lobbied to be the lead in this movie, and Oda wanted this as well, but they were overridden by Toho. Tsuchiya played the role of Rikichi in Seven Samurai, but he was fascinated by science fiction movies. So because Seven Samurai was filmed at the same time as Godzilla, he would often leave the set to go see Godzilla being filmed. Because I was doing Seven Samurai, I couldn't appear in the first Godzilla. That's why I insisted they put me in the sequel. And in a separate interview, he would say, Most actors get comfortable with a certain genre and they stick to that. But as far as I was concerned, it was equally prestigious to appear in science fiction films or in Kurosawa movies. Funny enough, Tsuchiya not only loved science fiction, but he was fascinated by UFOs and would even write a book about it. Not surprisingly, we'd see him play an alien in a future Godzilla film. Tsuchiya's character, Tajima, is now in the Air Force, which comes into play for the movie's final action sequence. As Kobayashi goes between his work party and his friends, we hear the patrons singing the famous Hokkaido fisherman song, Soren Bushi. Too bad there was no dancing. In the English version, the song would be replaced with He's a Jolly Good Fellow. While enjoying themselves, our characters hear that Godzilla has sunk a company ship in Hokkaido. Another funny coincidence that Godzilla just happened to follow them up north. Kobayashi's character is given more dimension as Hidemi pries into his love life and the film returns to a more lighthearted mood. They eventually spot Godzilla on the fictional remote island of Kamiko and inform the military. The climactic final battle is beautifully crafted by Tsuburaya, with one unfortunate shot showing a motionless Godzilla figure from above. Originally, this prop was supposed to move via a wind-up motor, but unfortunately it malfunctioned. This icy battle would be partially filmed outdoors, with a set that made Godzilla itself seem small compared to the enormity of nature. The way this plays out is a little odd. Instead of taking place as one climactic sequence, the movie breaks it up into two parts. The first part concludes with Kobayashi sacrificing himself, trying to prevent Godzilla from leaving the island, buying time for the military. Tsukioka's reaction to seeing his friend and co-worker dying leaves much to be desired. Oh, my friend is dead. That sucks. Having a Japanese pilot sacrifice himself in a film was a bold move in post-war Japan. Just a few years prior, movies were not allowed to show kamikaze-style action in a positive light, but it's Kobayashi's sacrifice that leads to Godzilla's eventual defeat. His plane crashing causes a mini avalanche, giving Tsukioka the idea to bury Godzilla. They start to do this, but then inexplicably they stop, and they fly back to the military base. I understand logically why the characters did this, the planes need to refuel and whatnot, but entertainment wise this was a poor choice. This could have been written in a way so they did not need to break up the final battle and lose the momentum the film had with Kobayashi's death. Instead this ending becomes drawn out, when the military returns we see them blast the mountain multiple times. I mean, way too many times. We didn't need that many damn shots of the mountain getting hit. But there are exciting moments when Godzilla downs a few planes. Godzilla is slowly buried in ice and snow, which was created with real ice using an ice crusher and an ice machine that was borrowed from a Tokyo skating rink. The pilots eventually succeed, and Godzilla is trapped in the avalanche. Tsukioka ends the movie telling Kobayashi they did it for him. Godzilla Raids Again would release in Japanese theaters on April 24th, 1955, and the movie would go on to sell almost 8.5 million tickets, a little over a million fewer than the first movie. Domestic critics panned the movie as a rushed mess that was obviously just a cash grab. In later years, Tanaka would write, We didn't have much preparation time, and it would be difficult for me to say the production was successful. Much like the original, the Japanese version was released to Japanese-speaking theaters in the United States prior to an altered American version that has quite the backstory. As I covered in my last video, the U.S. Americanized Gojira into Godzilla, King of the Monsters in 1956. Seeing the success it had in its box office run, a group of Hollywood producers would also snatch up the distribution rights for Godzilla Raids again. But they didn't care for the story and just wanted to use Tsuburaya's special effects shots, and so they hired screenwriters to write an original screenplay. And in 1957, the writers would finish the final draft, and they would title it The Volcano Monsters. 
Toho was all on board with this and even created new suits for the movie and shipped them to Hollywood. The story would revolve around two dinosaurs that were natural enemies being awakened and then they proceed to do battle while destroying San Francisco. New special effects scenes would be filmed to supplement the original, but the human characters would be replaced with Caucasian actors. But before the film could get made, the production company went under and the rights were abruptly sold to another group of investors led by Paul Schraebman. Under his leadership, they reworked Godzilla raids again into Gigantus, the fire monster. Hey kids, the fantastic fire monsters are coming. Mighty Gigantus crushing whole cities in its wrath. Deadly Angura screaming its challenge of battle to the death. They're out to destroy each other, but first they'll destroy the world. Look out for Gigantus the Fire Monster! As for those Godzilla and Angura suits, they were apparently never seen again. Nobody knows what happened to them. Though recently, I did see a rumor online that the suits were recovered in America. I have no idea if that's legitimate or not. Anyway, Gigantus the Fire Monster was a VHS I had when I was young, and it of course confused the hell out of me. Why were they calling Godzilla Gigantus? The rewriting was done by Hugo Grimaldi, and both monsters' names and origins are changed. Gigantus and Angerus are described as two related species of prehistoric fire monsters. This is why Godzilla sometimes has Angerus' roar in this version. Additionally, almost all of Sato's music is replaced with stock music from other science fiction films. Schreiben would say that he changed Godzilla's name to Gigantus to give the impression that this was a new monster as he thought this would do better than a Godzilla sequel. He would later claim to regret that decision, and who can blame him? This version of the film is easy to knock. Not only do they rename Godzilla, but Tsuburaya and Oda are victims as well in the opening credits, amongst others. Eli G. Tsuburaya and Motoyoshi QDQ. QDQ. I mean, I have no room to mock how people spell or pronounce words as I've made some pretty horrendous mistakes in my own videos. It's worth noting Schreibman's name was spelled correctly, of course. For some bizarre reason, they added performance footage to the Osaka nightlife scene, and in that footage, there were what appears to be Nazi swastikas on the sides of the stage. I've actually seen some people say that this was the Hindu swastika, but to be honest, I'm not too sure. Either way, it would be crudely edited out. The lowest hanging fruit being the dubbing, which was done by Rider Sound Services and featured veteran performers like Key Luke and George Takei of later Star Trek fame would do voice work as well in this film. But it's Luke who has perhaps the most infamous dubbed Godzilla line in history. I'm glad you're here. You're so brave, Skyoka. Absolutely darling. Ah, banana oil. To us, that line sounds completely random and hilarious, but banana oil was slang from the 1920s that basically meant nonsense. Takei would say it was a close enough word to fit the mouthing for the Japanese word bakero, which was being said in the original. As Hidemi looked toward the sky, she saw in the far distance the smoking inferno. The city was on fire. This narrating goes overboard, and at times you think you're listening to an audiobook. The beginning of the film has a stock footage montage talking about humanity's scientific progress, and this was narrated by Marvin Miller. And I keep seeing in some sources that Miller also dubbed Kobayashi. But wait, I thought Dawes Butler, the man who voiced Yogi Bear, did Kobayashi. What are you doing? On the house! <laughs> I mean, listen, it sounds like Yogi Bear, so I'd believe you if you said Dawes Butler. But depending on the source, you get two different answers to this question. Maybe you guys in the comments can figure this one out for me, but I'm gonna go under the assumption that Miller is the voice actor for Kobayashi. Yeah, I'll be up all night thinking about this one. One scene in particular that is not dubbed well at all is the meeting with the military officials and scientists. So, wouldn't that open worlds new to you all? So, a new book came out and we learned so much. And it is called Anguillosaurus, killer of the living. Anguillosaurus? True. Take a look at this, it's a picture. Shit, jaga. Shit, jaga. Nonetheless, Paul Schraebman would actually sell the rights to Warner Brothers and they would release this film in the US on May 21st, 1959. It would be a part of a double billing with teenagers from outer space. See the war of the 
fantastic fire monsters that rains destruction on the world. See Gigantus, the fire monster from Warner Brothers. Also, teenagers from outer space, young hoodlums from another planet, on a fantastic ray gun rampage across the motion picture screen. I couldn't find any exact data on how well it did in theaters in the U.S., but considering the film did not get shown on TV until the rights went back to Toho in the 1980s, I'm going to assume it didn't do too well in the U.S. In a humorous inside joke, the 2014 video game Godzilla for PlayStation 3 and 4 would add in Angerus' bio that he once battled a monster called Gigantus, who has since been banished from this plane of existence. Now, some may not like this movie, but we can give it credit for one thing. Bringing the cinema world the idea of two giant monsters fighting each other while destroying a major city. With Godzilla raids again not having the same punch as the original, Tanaka decided to let Godzilla slumber in his icy tomb for a while and concentrate on other kaiju ideas. The second half of the 1950s and early 1960s would see the rise of Rodan, Varen, and Mothra with all three movies being directed by Honda, who couldn't escape the monster movies after all. Despite being so in touch with humanity, he would help bring us some of cinema's most famous giant monsters and help expand the kaiju population of Toho's growing cinematic universe. During these years, Honda would also help create science fiction films like The Mysterians, Battle in Outer Space, and The H-Man. But Honda's most famous creation wouldn't return until 1962, in the most contentious giant monster battle of all time. Next up is 1962's King Kong vs. Godzilla. Eat your vegetables, kids. Mm -hmm. 